Okay, good evening. Welcome everyone to the latest in our events program, lockdown events program of webinars. Um, this evening we're looking at sake and regionality. Uh, I'm Julia from WSET School London and that is the last you're going to hear from me as I'm going to pass you over to Natsuki uh, who's going to tell you about it. Great, thank you Julia. Um, hi everyone again, my name is Natsuki. Um, this is my very second uh, webinar with WSET and hope everybody's uh, doing well. Uh, I know some of the areas, not UK yet, but some of the countries like Japan and Asian countries being, um, they, 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 uh, they started to going back to normal and all the restaurants started open. So um, I'm sure a lot of things have been changing and you guys are quite busy. So thank you very much for coming from uh, all around the world. Uh, my name is Natsuki and I am one of the um, uh, developer of the sake qualification for WSCT. Uh, so together with Anthony Moss, MW, uh, at the WCT, I, I set up the WCT level three, uh, I was in sake, uh, which is this textbook. So if you, I know many of you have already been taking this course, but um, if you're interested to learn advanced knowledge of the sake, you're all be, very welcome to join. Um, Okay, so I will start the, the second originality PowerPoint, uh, the presentation. Uh, like last time, um, we have a lot to cover. Um, I know it's impossible to cover the whole parts of Japan and originality, so we, I tried to select some of the very selective, um, distinctive areas of Japan that shows originality and the particular style of sake. Um, Julia, would you be able to... Move the slide for the next page, please. So, um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar where is Japan and uh, some of the facts about the Japan. But um, Japan is this uh, very long stretched island. And actually, the main island is consists of fine, uh, five, with Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu islands. But um, actually, there's over Oh, nearly actually 7,000 islands, uh, including with this main island. So we have lots of uh, small islands around it. And the very north tip of Hokkaido, um, where it's in the pink color, uh, the Wakanai, which is located at the same latitude as uh, Montreal, Canada, Canada, or southern tip of, um, and then if you go nearly down the south, uh, there is a tropical island called Okinawa. Um, which has the same latitude as Hawaii or Florida or Bahamas. So you can see from north to south, the Japan is very, Japan has a very different climates and uh, um, sceneries and landscapes you can see. And uh, also Japan is located in the northeastern ring of fire, which means it has a lot of volcanic activities. So um, there's over 100 active volcanoes and uh, which is 10% of the world's volcanoes and which could um, contribute to one of the, our main touristic uh, destinations, such as um, onsen, the hot springs. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are very longing to go to Japan, so I try to put a lot of the touristic um, essence for tonight, so we can kind of virtually travel to Japan tonight, hopefully. Um, also, 73% uh, of the Japan is a mountain, and 63% out, uh, out of that is forest. So we are very green and mountainous. Um, country. And we have many rivers, uh, but most of the rivers are tend to be quite short, steep, and swift. So that connects to some of the water qualities that we have. Uh, we'll mention that on a later on. And we are surrounded by sea, but uh, four different seas. So Sea of Ohotsuku in those, Sea of Japan on the west, and East China Sea on the south, and Pacific um, Ocean on the east. So that really also provides Japan a very, very wealthy uh, culture of foods and different climates as well. Should we be able to move on to the next slide, please? So the, today's topic is about the uh, regionality. I know when I used to work in a restaurant as a sake sommelier, um, one of the most commonly asked questions was, does sake um, express its terroir? And if you are, you know, um, passionate wine drinker, um, it's very common things to think about. Are we, you know, are we um, 
the sake has a similar regionality influence or in, uh, relationship to the region and uh, um, where rice is grown. So all these things being asked and I was always struggling to answer um, because of the many factors. So I will try to cover all the factors that, may, that could be related to the regionality and the terroir of the sake. So let's start from the water. So water is one of the main ingredients of the sake as, um, as you know, over 80% of the sake uh, in the bottle is water. And, and as the rice doesn't contain any juice, uh, we add all this water uh, in the process of sake making. And that easily translates into the importance of the water source. Um, so where the best water is, uh, the sake brewery locates. So that's uh, one kind of common thing that when you learn about the location of the sake brewery. So ideal water for sake is, is something, uh, is the water quality that is uh, clean and pure. So some water, quali uh, water quality that doesn't have any irons, because the iron actually changed the color of the sake. It's not ideal to have any trace of that. And also low organic matters, like you know, any drinking water as well. Um, so you need an abundance of nice water. And um, you can easily think that it express the terroir of the sake, because um, you know, the water of the sake, uh, uh, water of Japan, water of Japan, it tends to be quite soft. And many people already know the quality of, let's say, the Japanese whiskey to be like text, very soft and velvety textures and smooth that comes mainly from the water quality to be very soft. And uh, all the connection of the um, Japan's to be very, um, uh, very mountainous and very short mountains tend to be compared to a lot of uh, European Alps and, and so on. Um, plus a lot of rainfall, snowfalls in the, in the winter time, especially in the north part of Japan, as well as the, as I mentioned, the river uh, lengths to be much shorter and steeper. The water circulates much quicker than um, other parts of the world, um, as well as the soil of, of Japan tend to be much lower in the limestone. So all that included in Japan, water tend to be quite soft and pure and clean. And uh, we have abundant amount of water as well. So one way you can say, yes, that's exactly the terroir the water expresses the terroir of, the, of, of sake uh, in Japan. But at the same time, uh, in J Japanese legislation, you are actually allowed to adjust the mineral content of the sake. So you, you, can, you can either filter them or add the minerals back in to adjust the mineral content of the sake. So in that way, you can or you cannot, it doesn't have to be uh, expressing the terroir in terms of the water. Um, at the WCT level three hours in sake classes, we actually do um, um, water tasting. So we do blind taste two sakes, uh, one sake made from the very hard water lesions and the other sake made from the very soft water lesion. And we intentionally ask students to guess which one is soft and which one is hard. And it's one of the hardest blind tasting, to be honest. And I personally really struggle for myself to blind taste because um, let's say if it's 300 years ago when there is no you know, developed techniques of the sake making, uh, this mineral content of the water mattered a lot. But today it actually doesn't, um, you know, with, with the help of the development of the e strains and good e strains, as well as uh, like all the techniques of the fermentation, the temperature controls in the tank, actually you, you know, the mineral content of the water um, can, can be covered or adjusted by, by the different techniques uh, during the production. So it doesn't, um, actually it doesn't, compared to the past, a uh, couple, uh, many hundred years ago, it's actually much um, less impact to the sake. But um, whenever you visit the sake brewery, I highly recommend you to taste the water they make the sake with, and because you find the connection, um, the textures and base. So the water, I, I still believe that provides the base of the sake. So that's about the water. The second ingredient of the main um, ingredients of the sake is rice. So um, as you know, we use um, table rice as well as the sake specific rice, which is a premium, like a specific rice variety that's only made for sake making. And we have over a hundred different varietals of that. So in that way, you can easily say, um, yeah, you can express terroir by using your local rice. That's right. But compared to the grapes, um, rice can be transferred um, 
because it's not fragile as well. You can actually export to overseas even. So in order to, uh, to show terroir, uh, it's, it's quite difficult, um, you know, because you can actually source any rice anywhere. Third ingredient of the sake is uh, koji, koji uh, fungus. So most of the producer purchase koji mold spores from the manufacturers. And in the past, yes, there are hundreds of koji manufacturers all around Japan. But today, actually, we only have a seven companies existing. So knowing that, uh, unless there is a local koji manufacturer, koji mold manufacturers next to your brewery, um, it's quite difficult to make a koji very, very local. But if you go back to the very ancient times, um, uh, you know, our ancestors have been making sake with the koji mold that's being inoculated from the rice field, which cause uh, koji mold is believed to be living in the rice field as well. Okay, and next is yeast. So that's the fourth ingredient of the sake. And uh, again, um, in the ancient times, all the sake was made with ambient yeast, um, wild yeast. Um, so that is whatever that's available at the brewery is, is, is what you get. But today, because of the development of the cultured yeast, um, most of the producer uses the Kyokai Kobo, which is an association yeast that's been distributed uh, cultured and distributed by the uh, Brewing Society of Japan. So all these, um, uh, that is quite difficult to show at uh, regionality and terroir um, unless this cultured yeast uh, um, is isolated originally from your brewery, or your, your origin. So knowing all this fall, um, you can, but in general, it is quite difficult to be 100% local or regional sake. Um, of all the raw ingredients, four raw ingredients that I just mentioned. And other factor of the regionality um, in sake, I think, I personally think that plays a big impact is food culture. So as I, as I showed you the map of Japan, um, we have 47 different prefectures um, in Japan and each region, each prefecture has a very strong, unique um, local food culture. So depend on you on the, on the seaside, are you on the Japani, uh, Japan, uh, Sea of Japan side or Pacific side, the, the, the type of fish that you capture is different. And if you're in the inland, uh, you have completely different food cultures in there. If you're out of the mountains uh, in, in the very heavy snowfalls, um, you, you might have to rely on a lot of preserved food, uh, which can be higher salt uh, content or um, rich flavored. So all these could um, influence the um, sake that pairs well with. Um, and I think it still plays a quite big role um, of the uh, typical style of regional sake that um, is in Japan. But uh, knowing that because of, you know, just the transportation, you can actually buy any sake anywhere uh, today, it's quite difficult to be 100% local again. Um, knowing, and then the last bit about what influence what impacts the sake quality and styles is the techniques and the human hands. Um, so again, ancient times, it's, it was quite difficult for um, all, all these techniques and uh, com um, techniques and method was company secret. Everybody's, every household has its own, their own styles and their own secrets to make their tasty sake. But after all this National Institute of Brewing, uh, National Research Institute of Brewing, or any other governmental universities, all this uh, institute has been founded. All this um, expertise and methods has been shared throughout the country. So uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a conclusion, you can easily say any style and the quality level of sake can be made anywhere. So last week we mentioned about the sake made outside of Japan and its numbers are growing. And I believe the quality of the sake, these sakes are really growing as well. So, um, so in one hand, you can, you can say that um, sake doesn't have a terroir that as directly as wine, but you can, as you can see, um, sake quality and style is consist of the, such a complex um, process and uh, you know, quality of the ingredients and the techniques of the uh, producer and the land and the culture that um, you know, um, grow the uh, sake, sake drink itself is. So today uh, I wanted to introduce some of the distinctive area that shows um, a sake styles um, 
than the other. Can you please uh, go to the next slide, please? So um, this is just another note that, uh, that includes the, the technique or the human hands effort side. Uh, there is a uh, toji gills. So toji in Japanese means head brewers of the, of, of the sake brewery. So uh, each brewery has, it consists of this production team that's very hierarchical and that uh, on top of the team, there is a toji. So he's in charge of the production and uh, you know, who will lead the teams to go through the, this hard, uh, hard process of sake making throughout, throughout the winter and the springtime. And toji guilds are the regionally based organization of tojis that share the brewing techniques and expertise as well as protect regional styles. So um, when you, uh, so this has been the culture that's been con continued from Edo period, which is over 300 years. And um, even though there aren't any certification, um, each regional toji group has formed their own associations and they've been passing down all these techniques by themselves. And uh, at once, uh, um, we used to have about 100 uh, toji guilds all around Japan. But uh, these, these days today, we only have uh, 30 remaining. Um, so the three notable ones are Nambu Toji from Iwate Prefecture, Echigo Toji from Ni Niigata Prefecture, and Tamba Toji from Hyogo Prefecture. So these names are actually all former names of the regions. And uh, each region has its own special um, styles and uh, proud of the sake local styles. So the reason because uh, the, uh, the reason behind why this Toji Gil's culture has been dying is some of the factors. So uh, sake making teams has um, traditionally or historically it's been uh, seasonal workers. So these people who um, work in the rice fields in the summertime or the, as a fisherman or work in the timber. So mainly the first um, um, industry uh, fast industry uh, working in the fields has um, nothing to do in the winter time mainly. So what they do is they will go to the brewery, uh, maybe can be a local, can be outside of the prefecture, and uh, make a, do a sake making. So that's uh, that's how toji has been formed. They are the seasonal workers that's you know doing other things in the summertime and winter time they go go to the brewery and, and make sake. Same for the tojis as well. So knowing that how agriculture sectors, like you know, you know, younger people are going to the ITs and other um, industries apart from the agriculture. So it's the same common, common problem for any other countries, but because of this, uh, toji culture has been decreasing. Can you please uh, go to the next slide? So uh, the, this is Toji Gil's structure. So how the brewery, inside of the sake brewery team, um, there are not, traditionally, there are Kuramoto, which is a sake brewery owner, and then Toji, who has been working as a top head of the production. And then there are a lot of people um, who is underneath, so as I mentioned, it's a hierarchical organizing structure. Um, the Kashira is the one that's behind, below, below Toji, that works as a kind of like a manager role. To, to look after all the other guys. And we have some Kajia who is in charge of the koji making, Motoya who is in charge of the shubo making. So, and then goes down to the bottom and, the, and then uh, the very young guys are in charge of washing or uh, cooking, cooking a meal for other team members. So that has been the kind of former uh, traditional organization who was making sake. But these days, as, as I mentioned, Toji Gills has been, um, decreasing culture, kind of disappearing culture. A um, lot of Kuramoto, which has in the past, has only been the, doing the management or business side of the world, has taken himself to learn about sake making and become toji as well. So the, the trend these days are Kuramoto toji. So the kind of combination of the two, uh, Bri owner himself would go to the university to learn about the fermentation brewing and do some entrepreneurship with other friends brewery and then become toji in, the, uh, in, his, in their age of 30 or 40 years old. So there are many young tojis these days uh, from this factor. So knowing that uh, toji guilds um, con 
Toji Gill's influence has become less and less um, to the sake production styles. Can you go to the next slide? Just wanted to mention uh, this geographical identification of the sake. So all, all the other drinks, like including champagne or um, cherries, all, all this has um, GIs, geog geog uh, geographical identification. Um, this exists in sake as well. So the top three, uh, Nadagogo, GI Hakusan, and GI Yamagata. So these are the registered GIs, as well as the G GI Nihon, uh, that's the sake, it's been registered as a GI term as well. Plus this designation of origin. So it's not, um, it has slightly more stricter rule, um, such as there were some, some stickers that you can see, or the, sag the Saga certificate, or the Niigata um, OC. So these ones, uh, they strictly decide the um, certificate to go to the sake that's made from the local, sake, uh, local rice. So there were, there were some sign um, specifically, you have to make with this particular rice that's from Yamagata Prefecture, there was Sansan rice. And you have to make it into Jumai Ginjo spec. And if you do so, you can get this sticker to, to be posted on the, on, on the bottle. So it's much a little bit more stricter. But more and more producers are going, moving towards this direction to, to show what uh, special they can show from, from the region. Um, even though, um, Yamada Nishiki, the king of sake rice, um, is the mo still the most um, famous rice, and people buy from you know people buy that from all the way, or, or uh, even even they're from, not from the Hyogo prefecture. Can you go to the next slide. So let's move on to the each region. So the first uh, prefecture I wanted to introduce you is Hyogo prefecture. Um, this is the biggest um, sake production center. Um, has been for a long time, since 18th century. And today I brought a sake, um, can call the Kenbishi from another, another um, area. And uh, another, uh, another Gogo area, which is one of the GI, uh, sorry, GI Nada Gogo is the one of the GIs. And uh, that's the, um, coming from this Hyogo prefecture. So Hyogo prefecture, as you can see on the map, it's kind of Western part of mainland Japan. And um, it it's, has been a biggest, one of the biggest ports to ship the product to Edo, which is a former Tokyo. So Tokyo has been the capital for a while. And uh, what they are doing is lots of products has been shipped from the port of Nadagogo. Um, and uh, uh, shipped towards the Tokyo prefecture to the capital of Japan. So having the biggest port available plus the um, water quality. So the water of um, Hyogo prefecture tend to, tend to be historically known as a, a semi-hard water. So as I mentioned, water in Japan in general is very, very soft, super soft. And 300 years ago, when there's no temperature control system for sake making, it was quite difficult to make sake with almost no mineral water. If it's the water is too soft, the fermentation didn't go through. It didn't, it didn't kick start later, later on. So um, Miyamizu, which is translated as a water from the gods, that's all, that was available from the Hyogo prefecture, was, um, um, was the, one of the best water they believe to be to make sake. So hence the lots of sake brewery moved to this region to make sake. And also Hyogo Prefecture is known for the home of Yamada Nishiki Rice, the king of, king of uh, Yamada Nishiki Rice. So, um, that's, so having a rice, uh, ni nice Yamada Nishiki Rice, having a nice rice, having nice source of water that ensures the fast reliable ferment, plus the climate that's coming from uh, Loko Mountains. So the, there's a mountain called Loko Mountains on the north part of Kyogo. And that has been blowing a very cold, dry wind in the winter time. That was a perfect uh, wind to cool down the rice and it also um, could chill the fermentation. So when you wanted to have the base, a low cold ferment um, to make a pure, beautiful um, sake, it was very, very ideal. So all this co combination um, of the water, rice, and the climate 
um, the style of sake tend to be slightly less aromatic and firmer texture, more, um, tend to develop slightly more umami, and uh, it was called as otoko sake. So otoko sake uh, translates as a male sake. Um, so it has quite firm and quite um, muscular, I can say, and uh, nice richness to it. And this particular sake, um, Kenbishi has a really nice umami, and I think it's a great sake to warm up. So that is a Hyogo sake, quite uh, firm, umami, and less aromatic, and quite muscular, a macho type of sake. Can you go to the next slide, please, Julia? So this shows the illustration of Nadagogo um, areas. So you can see each port has the names. Um, and uh, so since around the 18th century in Edo period, mid Edo period, um, they have been actually making 80% uh, of the sake consumed in Tokyo, Edo, uh, Edo capital, capital Edo. And um, so all this combination of good ingredients and the water, plus the, there was a tarukaisen, which is, is what's the barrel shipment um, that's going to the Tokyo, what's going there. So a lot of producers was almost, almost competing who is going to Tokyo faster so they can win the competition in the capital of Tokyo. So that's, that's quite incredible that um, it's been the same um, since the 18th century to, until today. So what, most of the biggest company locates in Nadagogo area, including this Kenbishi. Okay, can you go to the next slides? I just wanted to show you some land, beautiful landscape of Hyogo Prefecture. Um, the left um, waterfall is from, from one of the best, actually two, these two pictures are from the best um, area to grow a Yamada Nishiki rice, the king of sake rice. Um, so it has a beautiful, nice waterfalls called uh, Kurodaki and uh, nice rice fields um, to make the special air region, like with Grand Cru uh, region of the Yamada Nishiki rice. Can you click one more? So I just wanted to show, so each, I, I just wanted to show each region's best things to eat with sake. <laughs> so you can uh, not only learn about the regional style of sake academically, uh, today you can learn um, what to eat from where, where you visit each region, and also you can be hungry looking at it. <laughs> so um, this, you can kind of look like, maybe if you've, you've been to Japan or familiar to Japanese food, it looks like uh, takoyaki. Takoyaki is this a bowl of um, octopus uh, inside. It's, it's, like a, it's like a pancake, quite savory pancake, uh, but uh, octopus inside. And that's famous food for Osaka Prefecture. But actually, Hyogo has a better version of it. <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's my personal opinion. But so Hyo, this, this is called Akashiyaki. Akashiyaki is different from okonomi, uh, the Takoyaki, Okonomiyaki. Akashiyaki is it looks like a takoyaki, but it has that much more fluffy egg content is it, in it. So it's really softer and less flour inside. So it's almost like an egg omelet. And how they eat it is you dip it into a nice broth. So it's very, very calming and mellow and really tasty umami savory dish. Uh, really work, works perfect with a, a nice Kyogo prefectural sake. And these days, I didn't mention this, the GI Harima has been registered last year. So this is a most recent geographical ident identification term um, that's also coming from Hyogo Prefecture. Okay, let's move on to the next capital, uh, which is Kyoto. Um, I call it as abundant water capital. So Kyoto is the second biggest sake production area of, of, of Japan. And as everybody knows, it's one of the most famous uh, touristic destination to go. Um, and it's old capital of Japan between 794 to 1869. And uh, geographically, um, Kyoto has this basin called Kyoto, Kyoto Basin. And uh, it's very flat land as well. And uh, underneath of this Kyoto Basin, there is abundant water hidden underground. So I learned that there's 211 trillion tons of underground water um, that's been sleeping underneath of Kyoto Basin. So if you ever visit Kyoto, you have no, um, you'd never have a chance to um, be a shortage of water 
it has a lot of water underneath ground, ground. And there is a contact to Biwa Kok, Biwa Lake, next prefecture as well. So um, that ensures um, you can make a lot of sake using this uh, nice water. And not just the amount, but also the quality of the water is uh, quite contrast compared to Hyogo. So Kyoto uh, water is known for the soft quality water. Com um, so compared to the Hyogo prefecture to be semi-hard, it's very, very soft and delicate style of sake. So minerals in water works kind of like a fuel. So if there's a high mineral content, um, the koji enzymes and the yeast activity fastens up and boost up. So that become, again, as I mentioned, quite firm and rich in umami for style of sake like um, Hyogo prefecture. But if it's opposite, like um, Kyoto prefecture, um, when there's lower mineral, sake become me quite mellow, soft, and delicate. And uh, hence, the Kyoto sake has been historically been called as onna sake in contrast to Hyogo otoko sake. So onna means female sake. So I don't know this kind of sexual terms um, really is uh, um, um, relevant these days, but uh, they, they, send, they, they tend to say Kyoto sake tend to be delicate, aromatic, and elegant, like me. Um, so, uh, in terms of rice, uh, Kyoto doesn't have so much rice content, but there is a sake specific rice called Iwai, and you might be able to find that if you're um, looking through the sake brewery in Kyoto. And so as I mentioned, with this abundant amount of water in Kyoto, um, plus just being an old capital of uh, Japan, you, uh, classic Japanese culture has been established in Kyoto using this abundant water. So you might know this uh, Japanese tea ceremony, um, as well as flower arrangement, and the Japanese gardens. The, you know, Japan, I know British has a lots of beautiful gardens, but Japan also have beautiful gardens. And also this Kyoto Yuzen uh, stencil dime. So this beautiful kimonos, um, maybe it's better to flip to the next page, uh, Julia, sorry. So this beautiful uh, kimono, um, dyeing that's originates in Kyoto um, prefecture. Uh, they use for beautiful kimono, the traditional Japanese dress. Um, also use a lot of water too. So to develop all this beautiful Japanese uh, classic culture, um, Kyoto was the place because of this water abundance uh, quality. Okay, and then, so I just wanted to please uh, click the next, uh, Yes. So the food you have to eat uh, when you drink sake with a Kyoto, in Kyoto is this. Uh, I don't know if you can tell from the picture. This is a mackerel sushi. So when you say sushi, maybe a lot of people imagine nigiri, which is the fish on top and the rice on the bottom um, made by hand. But this is um, almost like a pressed sushi, which is actually an original sushi um, um, that was more of, that was a boom in this uh, western part of Japan. So the rice has been put kind of in the box and pressed together with a sea, uh, how do you call it, pickled um, marinated mackerel fish, saba, saba um, pickled mackerel, and they pressed on top. And uh, you can have a little uh, like a kelp kind of seaweed on top and it's really tasty. Um, so because of the, and it's, it's you know, the, the marinated uh, um, mackerel provides lots of umamis and has very very delicate flavors too so it's perfect perfect <laughs> um, pairing with uh, this soft delicate elegant uh, style of Kyoto cuisine I'm making you hungry okay but please just imagine that you're virtually traveling to Kyoto now let's go to the next destination oh actually um, I forgot to mention I also have the sake from Kyoto today from Sawaya Matsumoto uh, from Fushimi region. So Fushimi region is the uh, biggest center of the um, sake production in Kyoto and uh, known for the best soft water area. Very refreshing, almost a different essence. That's very, very modern style of sake with this nice spritz, but very, very clean and pure and mellow. And you can feel the softness from the water. So quite contrasting character compared to Kenbishi. So the next prefecture is Niigata. So um, if you see the map, Niigata locates in kind of middle parts of mainland, uh, 
facing a sea of Japan. And uh, Niigata is the third biggest sake production and uh, also a biggest rice grower. So they grow a lot of rice, including table rice and sake rice. And even though Hyogo and Kyoto is the biggest sake production volumes, um, Niigata is known for the biggest number of sake breweries. So within Niigata prefecture only, they are, there are 82 sake breweries existing. Um, so, so with that, and um, actually Niigata is a very um, pioneer in certain way that uh, they kind of create, uh, become a leader of the Ginjo boom uh, around the 86 to 91. And um, that was a quite big moment of Japan where um, most of the sake was very ricey and cereal and umami and full and rich and heavy and it's quite sweet. So lots of people were drinking sake as that styles and there was no much other choice. But because of the development of the ginjo sake, which you ferment sake in a very lower temperature using a rice um, that's being polished to a very low, um, uh, low polishing degrees. Uh, so you, ha you, you, you remove lots of the rice uh, along layers to um, only um, use the part, center part of the, of the rice, which is a pure starch. Sake become distinctly clean flavors and the very pure styles and the, um, um, very refreshing styles. So um, this has a connection to some of the transition of the Japanese um, industry. That, um, so around this 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, when Japan was having this economic boom after the war, a um, um, lot of people who used to work in the farms, like rice, rice agriculture or fishing or other farming areas of Japan, all these uh, sons of these uh, industry people moved to Tokyo, started to working in IT sectors or service sectors uh, or financial sectors, started to working in front of the computer. So imagine your daily routines of the work um, was working in the rice fields using lots of physical work labors. And all of a sudden that changed into sitting into the, into, almost like us in a quarantine, um, sitting in front of a computer all day. Um, type of thing that you need changes. So Niigata style of ginjo sake uh, was in response to the change of the industry that people wanted something much more sophisticated, elegant. They, did, they didn't need so much sugar in there. Um, that can be something as easy drinking as, um, as, as this style. So they, um, together with this very soft water quality um, coming from the lots of snow, uh, snow uh, falls during the winter time, plus the gohyaku mango kuras, which is the queen of sake rice, uh, second biggest sake rice, uh, rice brand of, of uh, sake rice. Together with Echigo Toji techniques, uh, Niigata style, uh, Niigata sake, uh, Niigata prefecture established a style called Tanrei Karakuchi. So Tanrei Karakuchi translates as light, dry, and pure, and clean, and known as distinctive kire finish. So very cleansing, refreshing, and light, and uh, kind of dry, um, kind of cleansing your palate. Very, very shorter finish, but cleanse your palate nicely. So today I have I don't have all the sake from the H pictures. I, I, this is my third sake and last sake. I have this uh, Koshino Kanbai that's being distributed here in the UK uh, by World Sake Import. Um, Koshino Kanbai was one of the pioneer, uh, they are the, actually the pioneer of Tanrei Karakuchi Sake. So they are the, this company um, started to make this distinctive Niigata characters, which can be a quite Tanrei Karakuchi characters. So very lean, clean, pure, and has, yes, it's, it's a much shorter, simple um, finish, but really ends in nicely and cleanse your palate. Um, and I can, I can imagine you here eating something quite oily or fishy. Uh, this type of sake really cleanse your palate nicely as well. So that is a Niigata sake. Please go to the next slide. Julia. 
So um, this is a scenery. You can see a lot of uh, snowing in the rice fields of the, on the rice terrace. And uh, on the right-hand side picture is Echigo Plain uh, in the night before the um, rice planting season. So if the rice is a wet, land, uh, wet rice cultivation, it looks so beautiful. Um, you know, if you see the whole lands of uh, Niigata has been shining through with this water. And if you please click the next, Julia. Thank you. So um, the things that you have to eat, this is actually not a dish, but um, I think this is the best choice from this region. This is called kanzuri. I don't know how many people know this. Um, it does look like your very typical chili sauce, but this is not a typical chili sauce. This is uh, red peppers, chili peppers, that's been, pick, uh, that's been so, um, salt uh, pickled. And then actually they, they lay that on the snow um, directly. So by doing it, um, you know, it removes all this uh, bitter, dust, bitter, that, that bitter flavor of the um, chili and it actually makes it much, much sweeter. So they're almost like snow aged um, um, for, for a while. And afterwards they used that and they minced it together with yuzu and uh, they mixed with koji and they ferment it afterwards. So it has this kind of koji effect, very fermenting, and it's sweetness coming from the snow mature chili. So it, it does have a kick from the chili, but it's not just spicy. It has this sweetness and umamis and mellow flavors. It's perfect, perfect um, to pair with the spicy Niigata style of sake. And I love to use uh, this kanzuri uh, to replace wasabi. So when you're eating sashimi, for example, just the soy sauce on this, perfect. Or if you're eating ramen or any bowl of noodles, just add a touch of that. You can mix together with any uh, oils and make nice dressings. So it's just perfect condiment to, um, to enrich your dish. So uh, if you ever have a chance to go to Japan, um, kanzuri, please pick it up. It's from Niigata. And also Niigata is known for uh, a very big sake festival. Unfortunately, this year, because of the coronavirus, um, it, they had to cancel this. But every February, um, there are a big festival called Niigata Sake no Jin, which is uh, one of the biggest um, sake events, like sake tasting events, uh, which uh, actually most of the last year, we ha they had 140,000 people coming in and you get to taste all the sake from Niigata Prefecture and all the breweries there. So it's kind of like a, a Oktoberfest um, sake. So you have to visit around that time for Niigata. So let's go to the next prefecture, Akita. Yay, because um, this is my homeland, uh, my, where my family, um, sake brewing family is from. And uh, so that's where my heart locates as well. So I call Akita as a snow sake kingdom um, because it has lots of snows and that makes the sake, their sake really tasty as well. And it, Akita is known for the very um, high, um, high, how do you call it? The very advanced uh, skill of sake making. And as I already written, it's achieved the most number of the gold medal at the National New Sake Contest. So National New Sake Contest is one of the prestigious um, historical competition holds uh, every spring in Japan um, since 1911. Unfortunately, this year, they had to cancel the last competition um, judge so um, that's a very historical moment. Um, they, they only cancelled one year after the war, so that's their third um, cancellation year, unfortunately. But they, last year, they achieved the most number of the winning uh, gold medals within Akita Prefecture. So that proves they have a lot of skills uh, themselves. And they're also known for this uh, Akita-style kimoto. So if you uh, already know kimoto, so this quite classic style of sake making, um, incorporating lactic acid facilities, they tend to create nice acidity um, in a sake. Akita developed their own methods of making Akita kimoto styles. Uh, I don't go dig deeper too much, but if you're interested, please look, look into what, how, how Akita-style kimoto is different from the regular style. So, if you look at the Akita, it's very north part of Japan. And then uh, the, um, the, within the geography, uh, Ogu and their mountain ranges lands kind of in the middle of the Akita prefecture land. So that really splits um, the seaside and the um, 
the other side of the mountain, different climate. Um, so climate itself is very hot summer and cold, severe winter. So it has lots of snowfalls and that translates to become a very nice soft uh, snow melt water from the mountain ranges, from the old Wendewa mountains. And the uh, rice from Akita Prefecture is Miyama Nishiki and Akita Sake Komachi. Um, which Miyama Nishiki is, is a third biggest, a uh, third famous sake rice varietal um, for sake. And Akita Sake Komachi itself is also quite, um, even though this is only grown in Akita Prefecture, a lot of brewery outside of Akita actually likes it and buys it. And including um, um, UK's local sake brewery, uh, Dojima Sake Brewery, I know that they buy Akita Sake Komachi for their sake as well, and that proves their rice quality is quite, quite good. The east wise, I didn't mention from the other prefectures, Akita um, has its um, distinctive uh, east variety that's quite famous uh, na nationwide, which is uh, AK1. That's quite decent east, um, but because, how, uh, because they show a lot of um, success on winning a national New York sake contest, it, it used to be the prefectural east, but become um, uh, Kyokai Kombu Association East 1501. And our oldest national uh, association is number six, originates or isolated in Aramasa Brewery in Akita. So we have, uh, we have two famous uh, East strains from Akita too. And Sanlai Toji is the local Toji guilds that understands the climate, very cold region of, of the sake brew, uh, of uh, cold climate and then the ingredients as well. So they utilize this to, and they've been handing down um, how to make the best sake in Akita. So style of sake in Akita, um, I can say it's compared to the other uh, regions, it has a various styles. Uh, some breweries, um, Tend to be tend to be lighter, tend to be richer, but they tend to have because of of um, probably the food culture, I can say, or maybe the sunlight toji um, techniques. They tend to have a slightly mellow umami and a soft water quality coming from um, a soft texture quality coming from the water in there. And uh, if you go to the mountain side of Japan, a mountain side of Akita Prefecture, they really rely on uh, preserved food, which is quite sweet and umami full and salty. So imagine to pair something, pair something with, with these styles. Uh, these type of, uh, area, these area of, of Akita tend to make something richer and more umami full styles. Julia, can you um, go to the next slide? Thank you. So this is a landscape of Akita. Um, I just wanted to say Akita, um, Akita itself, it literally means autumn rice field. So Akita is known for a lot of rice fields. Um, you know, if you go to the countryside of Akita, just driving, you see a continuous uh, lands of rice fields and it's so beautiful um, in every season. And in the winter time, uh, with the snow, you can visit uh, Yokote, Yokimatsuri. This is, happens in the February, um, which they make uh, Kamakura this kind of snow dome, uh, it's called Kamakura, and uh, hundreds of snow domes been made. Um, yeah, the snow, uh, hundreds of snow domes been made, Kamakura has been made uh, for this festival. And you can actually physically go in there and they offer you nice mochis and amazakes and warm it up. So it's really nice festival to visit. And it's not just a uh, fashion to build this Kamakura, it's actually uh, by, uh, by building it, they're, they've been wishing to, um, to get the best abundant water for the following year to grow their rice and to make it sake. So they're actually praying for the gods of water by making it. And Julia, can you click the next slide? Um, Iburi Gakko. <laughs> this is my famous uh, fa favorite um, sake pairing with, uh, from Akita Prefecture. So Iburigako, so knowing that uh, a lot of household in the past had their own fireplace um, and they tried to make preserved food to survive in the winter time. So they're hanging the daikon radish. This is actually daikon radish, you know, the very long uh, white radish. So they're hanging the light, uh, daikon radish um, near the fireplace. So you get smoky flavors. And then uh, afterwards, they pickled with uh, lice, la, lice nuka, so which is the lice dust coming out from the 
polishing, right? So they're utilizing everything from, from their nature and what they, what they uh, didn't want to waste to make this. And these days, yeah, no, no household has their fireplace really in Akita. So mo no, most of the family buys um, already manufacturedly made Ibori Gakko. But so um, even, um, I, I know that in Akita, every year they have this uh, uh, competition for Ibori, uh, Ibori Gakko and the Ibori ingredients. So they're actually been smoking every, anything and they've been competing what, who, is the make, who makes the best Ibori Gakko in Akita, which I think is really exciting. <laughs> um, this itself is very tasty when you slice it thinly, but you can also uh, put a little bit of the like soft cheese, like cream cheese or some soft cheese in between. Lily makes a delicious combination. Okay. Are we ready for the next um, area? Hiroshima. So Hiroshima, it's very Western part of Japan, so end of mainland Japan. Um, as you see on the map. And um, the climate is much different compared to like Niigata or Akita, where, we, where we've been mentioning. So it's tend to be warm, mild, um, quite dry throughout the year. Um, but some of the mountain regions are quite cold in the winter and could have a chance of typhoons uh, compared to the other areas. And uh, geography-wise, depending on where you are, the, the um, various landscape you can find. So some, some areas are in mountain, some, some faces the um, sea uh, of uh, Setonai, Setonai Sea, and uh, also uh, hill, some hills as well. So depending on where you are, you can see different geography as well. And the water is a distinctive element what makes Hiroshima like a different, it's super soft. So I, I've been mentioning uh, the, I've been mentioning that the Hyogo style of sake tend to be quite firmer, rich, and then um, Kyoto style of sake is semi, semi, uh, softer. So just looking at the firmness, hardness of the water, um, another water from Hyogo is around 100 milligram, and Kyoto prefecture about 60 to 80. So it's softer than Hyogo, but not crazily soft. And Hiroshima actually being a 10 to 20 milligram, so it's like one tenth of another prefectural hardness. So imagine that a combination of very, very, very soft water, almost no minerals inside, plus warm and uh, quite mild climate. It's, it was quite difficult for the producer to complete the fermentation because there was no mineral to kick, um, you know, fuel, fuel, fuel or speed up the fermentation. So in the past, a lot of producers really um, um, struggled to make good sake. Um, in Hiroshima using a soft water from Hiroshima, super soft water from Hiroshima. And that's why this uh, kind of father of Hiroshima sake, uh, whose name is uh, Mr. Senzaburo Miura, um, had came up with a softer, um, soft water fermentation um, techniques. So, there, so I mentioned the founder of soft water fermentation. So he came up with the idea, if you actually um, make nice tsukihaze koji, so which means the koji mold spores deeply inoculated inside of the core of the rice. So make a quite firm koji enzymes until and long lasting koji enzymes. And then you ferment in a low temperature and longer period of time, you succeed um, to ferment even in a very super soft water. So that actually become a base of modern, modern ginjo sake making. You might, you might actually realize that. So um, I can say that Min Senzaburo Miura um, actually founded the, the base of modern sake today. Um, so apart from the water and their own techniques, they are known for the Hattan Nishiki, Senbon Nishiki rice, which is their local rice, sake, sake rice varietals. I love these rice varietals because it's quite particular. It shows a quite distinctive um, rice qualities. Um, so maybe because of the landscape that's been kind of facing to the seaside, uh, sake using hatta nishiki uh, or senbo nishiki more particularly tend to have kind of salinity, kind of salty characteristic. Um, I don't know you 
in my, in my imagination because it's where, where the rice is grown. But um, I can't really find that in any other, in, in other rice varietal, so which, is, which can be quite interesting to see when you're trying the sake from this, uh, using this rice. Um, and Hiroshima toji is their rice, uh, is their toji gills that's kind of passed down from the Senzaburo Miura techniques. Um, other thing that were, so all this com combined, actually the sake style of Hiroshima hasn't uh, have a specific style. Some areas quite richer and fuller, umami full. Some areas quite cleaner and drier and can be flagrant. So you can't really find the specific variety of Hiroshima sake, but I wanted to mention because it's such a historical and distinctive um, area to make this modern sake styles. Plus it has the biggest sake festival in Hiroshima called Saijo Sake Matsuri. So Saijo is one of the um, city uh, in Hiroshima prefecture and that um, has even have a sake street um, that even in the one, on, on one street there's nine sake breweries located and in uh, every October um, they are ho hosting this Saijo, Saijo Sake Matsuri, Sake Festival of Saijo, in Saijo and they uh, welcome over 200,000 people from all around the world um, and uh, it, it's one of the very exciting festivals to go to so I highly recommend you to visit Saijo, Hiroshima, around this season. Please go to the next slide, Julia. So this is some of the beautiful landscape. It's so beautiful, this Setonai Ocean. And um, um, you know, on the right-hand side, you can see this kind of crowd. You kind of see the two, two pictures looks like, but left hand side is actual sea. And right-hand side is a uh, crowd sea, like the sea of crowds. So you can see on top of the mountain, and you can overview the 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 landscape you know on top of the crowd which is very very beautiful scenery to go uh, to see in Hiroshima. Can you click the food? So um, I, it was quite difficult to find in Hiroshima because there's so much good food in there as well. But um, one thing I chose is this bishonabe bish, bishonabe or bishonabe. So bishonabe spell as a beautiful sake hot pot. So. This looks like a typical hot pot, but they actually put lots of sake inside when you are, you know, instead of water when you're cooking the hot pot. And, um, you know, also umami from the, you know, maybe many of you already know, sake not only for drinking, but sake is perfect thing to cook with. So it's really bring up the flavor of the, of the ingredients. And um, I highly recommend you to do so because it's, they don't require so much uh, special ingredients. You just need uh, like things uh, like pork and carrots, cabbage. So anything, anything that you have and mushrooms. And then you kind of stir fry them first with uh, salt and pepper, and then you pour lots of sake in. And uh, that's that's it. And it's really tasty, uh, nice fish, uh, hot dish to complete your sake experience. And also Hiroshima is known for the oysters as well. Um, so I was competing with, should I say, uh, deep fried oyster, kaki fry, or you know, or oyster itself, but um, I, I chose this one. So let's go to the next one. Um, I know we are already so one, one hour past nearly. Um, we have one more, no, two more destinations to go. If you have to go, uh, we'll make sure uh, put, we post this uh, recording and slides on the website so you can still look at it and learn. But I'll continue for ne next two prefectures. So Ishikawa Prefecture is the next prefecture. It's um, located on kind of back shoulder of, uh, uh, of, of a strip of sea, sea of Japan site. And there is, there is um, GI here, so GI Hakusan. Um, Hakusan is one of the city uh, in, Yama, uh, in Ishikawa prefecture and uh, I call Ishikawa as a Yamaha leg le uh, legacy land because uh, they have the very legacy toji guilds called Noto Toji and one of the unique techniques they use is uh, make lots of Yamaha sake. I don't know why but um, many great Yamaha sake comes from Ishikawa prefecture and Yamaha sake tend to develop lots of deep umami complexity and high acidity and touch of sweet flavor. So um, that's one of the very distinctive characteristics you can see in Ishikawa Prefecture. And Ishikawa Prefecture, um, the Noto, there is a Noto Peninsula. You can kind of see on the map a kind of this tail of the 
kind of tail of this dragon or on the back, that's the Noto Peninsula. And the, the, the climate there is very different. It has a very severe, um, severe climate that's uh, very, very less shining throughout the year and heavy, heavy snow and lots of thunder um, throughout the year. So with this heavy, um, very severe, um, harsh climate, the mentality of the people there is, is very patient. And the sake making really reflects, reflects the patience and the calm personality of the people there as well. Please uh, go to the next slide. So some landscapes, uh, left picture is a Kenrokuen. Um, so Ishikawa has, uh, Ishikawa's capital is a, is a Kanazawa city. So Kanazawa city is very nice uh, destination to visit as a tourist. Um, they call it as um, Sekan Kyoto. So kind of old capital, or old classic part of Japanese um, town is still remaining in, in the Kanazawa city. You can visit a lot of shrines and temples, including this beautiful garden called Kenrokuen. And uh, it has nice, beautiful um, sceneries, even for the snow, uh, winter time with the snow. And on the right hand side picture, it's a, <coughs> it's, it's a Senmaida, which is this rice terrace. Uh, so it's called Shiro, Shiroyone Senmaida, which is a terraced rice fields. And um, it's a once, over 1,000 small rice paddies on the steep slope along the seaside. So you can see the sea and a lot of these paddies. And you can see this, um, you know, pink illumination. So after the rice harvest, um, so and after I think from October to before the rice planting season in, in March, they illuminate these uh, um, rice paddies and it's so beautiful uh, on the sunset. And they, this area has been registered as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity in 2009 by UNESCO. So it's, it's one of the very, histor um, you know, one of the best place to visit to see the beautiful landscape. Please click the next one. So things uh, you have to eat with sake in Ishikawa is kabura zushi. Um, so it's hard to figure out what it is, but this white thing is a turnip called kabura. So it's a very fat, round turnip. It's very silky, soft, and nice texture. And what they do is they chop this kabu uh, turnip, and then they marinate with the salt. And afterwards, they put the marinated um, yellowtail caught in the winter time together with carrots. And they marinate it with uh, and also called kombu kelp as well. And they marinate uh, or uh, uh, pickled with uh, koji rice in there. So it's type of pickles by also nice, nicely lactic fermenting inside and very, very creamy, uh, koji umamis and lactic uh, flavors, mm -hmm. beautiful, um, like fatty yellowfish flavors. It's really mellow and tasty. Um, highly recommend you to eat that when you visit um, Ishikawa Prefecture. So last prefecture I want to mention Thank you for listening to me all this. Uh, it's Saga Prefecture. So Saga is the southern end of Sake Town. So you see, see the map, we're on the very west um, end tip of uh, Kyushu region. So um, Kyushu region um, on the very west, west islands of Japan, it's or Okinawa itself, or, or, um, these islands, has much more influence from China and Korea. And they're, um, because of the agriculture um, and the climate, they tend to make more shochu, which is Japanese spirit, um, also using koji, but it's, it's been distilled. Um, and uh, they're using not only rice itself, but also sweet potatoes and barley and buckwheat, so various different ingredients wherever you are that's been harvested. But Saga is one of the few rice farming lands in Kyushu regions, so um, they grow rice there. Um, so they make also shochu, but not only shochu, they, they make beautiful sake. And um, Saga is also known for the nice pottery, what's called Arita and Karatsu Yaki, uh, which makes a beautiful sake cup as well. Just the climate there is very, very warm, um, huh? quite warm and modest climates in there. And the geography, um, so they have lots of mountains, Mount Tenzan, uh, Senfuni Mountains, Kyuga Dake and Terra Dake. Um, and also there's a Saga Plains in the middle. So imagine there's a Saga Plain flatland surrounded by the mountains. It's, it's very incredible scenery when you visit the Saga Prefecture. You're 360 degrees surrounded by mountains. It's a beautiful feeling. Um, 
So with that, depending on where you are, but uh, water quality can be semi-hard to soft. soft some, some areas are softer, some areas are semi-hard. And they use the rice, uh, local rice called Saga no Hana. Or they also grow Yamada Nishiki, quite good quality Yamada Nishiki there as well. The local toji is called Hizen toji. Um, it's actually in uh, danger of disappearing because um, of the reason I mentioned earlier. So, um, interesting thing about Saga is their local palette. So, when I visit Saga, I'm from Akita, so I'm quite used to the northern flavor of the dish. Everything tasted so sweet. So, even the soy sauce I grabbed from the supermarket comes sweet and they, you, you eat the sushi with. So, this sweet um, characteristic of the local palates uh, tend to go really nicely with the local sake, uh, which is much sweeter than the average. So, the sake in saga is viscous, but it's not just the sweet, it's really balanced with nice acidity. So, it's a very juicy uh, balance with acidity. So that's the very typical saga. Um, I heard some people calling saga is a zinfandel of sake. Um, so highly sugary and highly acidic um, sake. It really goes nicely together with the sweet palate uh, dishes in the local area. Can you click the next uh, slide, please? So saga is a very um, Beautiful place uh, because of this water quality, pure, super clean, pure water quality, and the mountains. There's lots of uh, fireflies. So on the left-hand side picture, you can kind of see um, these uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, fireflies comes in the summertime. If you visit a lot of local rivers, you can see that still. Um, and then on the right-hand side, it's not a uh, rice field. It's actually tea gardens, tea, tea farms. So um, ure ure no tea uh, fields, uh, the Ureino tea is their local tea farms. Because of the water qualities and the great um, weather, um, they're also famous for the tea as well. And then, please click the food, Julia. Um, this one is the Saga specialty. So even though Saga, grow, uh, saga has everything, I can say, they have a great uh, citrus, uh, yuzus and citrus, other orange and hundreds of different varietal citrus fruits, and also they have a great meat and a lot of great vegetables. But uh, one of the things that shocked me was this yobuko no ika, it's a squid. But as you can see in the picture, it's a transparent. And maybe a typical squid that you see as sashimi or sushi, it's quite chewy, um, which can be fine. But this yobuko, yobuko uh, squid from yobuko town, which is a very northern tip of Saga Prefecture, is actually crunchy. You never, you know, you, you, you never imagine this is actually a squid itself. It's so crunchy and fresh and uh, transparent and beautiful. So I highly recommend you to have this experience uh, when you visit the Saga Prefecture there, together with a beautiful Saga Prefecture um, sake. So that's all about what I wanted to um, tell you today. Anybody has any questions? Julia, did you pick up any questions? I, I'm happy to answer. Julia? Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> right, let's see. Uh, there was one question earlier on um, regarding the snow in particular regions. You talked about how snow can be important for the quality of water. Would there be yeah. So they don't have any snow, and then would that have a, an impact on the sake? Um, you mean depending on the snow? Yeah. Or, I mean, I, I think it's just, uh, again, uh, about the water quality. So what type of minerals in there? Is it low? Is it high? Um, and also, uh, yeah, the snow, I, I think the snow falling in the mountain and gradually melting and going through the um, soils of the mountain that also takes the minerals from the soils as well. So that um, adds to the con uh, quality of the water, I guess. Cool. That sounds good to me. Um, or oh, some, some, sorry, some, some area, like some mountain doesn't get so hot in the spring even. So I, I know some snow takes maybe a hundred years to be melt and coming down. So that might be a quite nice romantic thing to know as well. Yeah, that, that's a lovely thought. 
I don't think I saw any other questions. If anyone has any, feel free to type them in now. There are a lot of people just saying thank you and it was really interesting, which I completely agree with. Um, as always, it's fascinating to learn more about, the, um, uh, more about what you know, really. Uh, I'll stop the recording here. If anyone does want to...